Hello and welcome to the Hard Sell, the programme where the stick in the small bucket rattles back, and our ongoing obituary for Martin Lambie Nan. We broke off the story in part one right when Channel 4 had just been launched, with a startling, colourful, vaguely futurist identity so hypermodern they needed to go to LA and invent new technology just to make it exist. For a while in the 1980s, as a result, Lambie Nen was known as the CGI guy, the man you went to for splashy computer graphics. A couple of years later, Lambie Nen made a foray into the world of advertising, fortunately for the premise of this show, directing a surrealist landscape for Smarties that introduced the Only Smarties Have the Answer slogan. Combining CGI with traditional cell animation in ways subtle and otherwise, in its way, it's even more impressive than the Channel 4 idents. He also made the follow-up in 1988, some sort of Olympics tie-in I expect. Who's the smarty smarty? Who's got what it takes to make it to the top? Will it be pink or red or yellow? Or green? Will they be saved by the maids? Will they fall foul of the milk chocolate aisles? <laughs> Make it snappy! Who's got all the answers? Smarty! Right? Because only Smarties have the answer! And of course for Hamlet, Robinson and Nan parodied their own most famous work. <laughs> Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. But television was obviously where they began and where the most famous work lived. And there was a point between 1991 and 96 where, if you lived in East Anglia, every terrestrial channel was designed by him and his team. They relaunched ITV Anglia in 1988, with a classy, vaguely nautical flag-based theme, which after decades of slowly rotating pewter horsemanship was downright radical. In creating this, they eventually identified three potential avenues, which were labelled The Night, A Night, and Good Night. The first, The Night, would have them sticking with the original logo slash mascot as much as possible. which turned out to be not at all. The original statue was just too stiff to be adapted in any dynamic way. So they moved on to option two, a night, which involved dropping the specificities of the original design in favour of the basic concept of a knight on horseback. The problem here was deciding what action he should be performing, because they obviously just couldn't have him twirling around endlessly in the year of our Lord 1988. But galloping about would look, in Lambie Nen's words, like the 330 at Haymarket, and jousting was considered too violent and cluttered. Besides, every time they thought they got a version that worked on screen, he looked all wrong in print. Or vice versa. So to option three, Good Night, where they gave up on any direct conceptual continuity whatsoever, dropped the night altogether, and went their own way. Although the final idea was still sparked off by the knight, and specifically his peasant, and how medieval heraldry worked. From this thought process emerged the thicket of triangles, all pointing eastwards, that became the new logo. After much wrangling over details like the colours, one of Anglia's directors was Mary Archer, wife of Geoffrey, 
who had reason in 1988 not to approve of the man whose lunch gave rise to spitting image. Nabby Nan and company got to work painting over the entire region. <laughs> You're watching Anglia. The logo is incorporated into a fluttering flag motif with a slate background theme, stately serif fonts, and of course triangles everywhere. Suddenly, Anglia had the most coherent, consistent identity in the ITV network. Unsurprisingly, when ITV tried to launch a national generic look a year later, designed by some other company, Anglia told them to sod off, joining the similarly distinctive TSW, TBS and a few others, in not adopting the look at all. Almost immediately after the Anglia brief was done, another television company came knocking. A bigger and newer one, in fact the very newest, BSB, British Satellite Broadcasting, the doomed public service broadcaster due to launch in September 1989, although they ultimately didn't. Amid more or less every potential problem or setback you could possibly conceive, and one or two that might only be perceptible in the higher dimensions. At this point, in late 1988, they were still relatively cocky, though, assuming that they'd have a monopoly, which, to be fair, was the whole point of the deal. Cocky enough to have constant childish internal squabbles between marketing and programming, which was holding BSB back as a television company almost as much as the fact that they couldn't get the damn technology to work. The number and identities of the actual channels themselves had only just been finalised, mostly, when the contract went out. BSB was torn between poncy conceptual names like Galaxy and Now, and bluntly utilitarian ones like The Movie Channel and The Sports Channel, resulting in a compromise, some of one, some of the other, that made no one very happy. Robinson Lambie Nen won the contract on the premise that the five... Five, yes, definitely five channels needed to work together, both literally and figuratively on screen. BSB had already created an icon for themselves, albeit almost by mistake, in the Squarial. That gave Lambie Nen something to work with from the start, specifically the diamond that came to dominate BSB's visual identity for all of the eight months it spent on screen. Every logo was enclosed in a diamond, and every ident used it in some way, as a light show, in the case of Galaxy, a sort of gemstone for now. Diagram for the sports channel. A complex and inscrutable stop motion construction for the power station. and a projector for the movie channel, whose ideas were directed by Martin Lambinen himself. <laughs> Alongside that, they provided a design template for trailers and menus and the like that was used across all five channels to give the service an identity both more coherent and infinitely classier than skies. It was only on screen for an eye blink, but it stands as further proof that the wrong service won. By 1990, Lambie Nan was recognised as the kingpin of television design, and the BBC quickly hired him, on a non-exclusive contract naturally, as consultant creative director for the brand. They'd already had a sort of soft reboot a couple of years earlier, led by Michael Peters, with a new and dynamic logo and some tentative attempts at corporate branding, consistent fonts and curling and the like. But the impact so far had been relatively minimal, largely because the new logo wasn't actually seen on screen that often. 
the channels instead having their own separate identities that owed little or nothing to the style guide circulated around the corporation when the new logo came along. And the logo itself also had some issues of its own, but we'll come back to them. The first thing Lampy Nam was called upon to do at the BBC was redesign the news, which badly needed rationalisation. Every main news programme had its own identity and theme, both musical and visual. While the irregular bulletin still used the Chinese lantern look. Specifically, Lamby Nam was asked to rebrand the 9 o'clock news, whose look would also provide a sort of general identity for BBC News as a whole. He came up with one of his most dynamic and ultimately controversial works. Based on the old Jupiter symbol from the BBC coat of arms, crossed with the concept of a transmitter station, it was supposed to be modernist and vaguely Bauhaus, but instead came across as faintly fascistic, an accusation which annoyed Lamby Nan until the day he died, and which he always blamed on George Fenton, the composer of the strident, air-punching music that accompanied it. Lambie Ned had wanted something ambient and soothing. Instead, he got a wide-eyed Wagnerian march, which was undoubtedly stirring, but combined with the visuals, created something downright terrifying. Still, if that was a misfire, it was only slight. The real job was rebuilding the two BBC channels themselves. BBC One's logo, the computer-originated world, was solid, but getting decidedly old. Not to say old-fashioned. BBC Two was even worse, labouring under the most uncharismatic set of idents in British television and an aloof, ultimately unknowable, bookish nerd of a logo. This was a real emergency job, and it was Lambie Ned who insisted that both channels should be revamped by the same team along the same template to create a corporate BBC identity. The main priority was to impose the BBC's new but strangely invisible logo and identity on the actual channels themselves, which were far too relaxed about themselves at this point. And this is where the great man and myself part ways, even though I'm pretty sure he's right and I'm wrong. The BBC had a promotions team, where Lambie Nen thought an advertising agency should be hired to go. People trained in the selling of products. The BBC presentation department at this point had extraordinary freedom to create all sorts of borderline hallucinatory tableau, which Lambie Nan saw as just purposelessly dicking around. And technically he was right, they were dicking around. These were triumphs of form over function, and did very little to promote a truly coherent identity or brand for their channels, only really alluding to them at best. And that may have been enough when there were only four channels, but that era was ending, and British television knew it. Every station and service was unifying itself around some solid symbol just to stand out amid the increasing crowd. Channel 4 already had such a symbol, thanks to Lambie Nan himself. ITV had just introduced theirs. The BBC had tried to launch one for the corporation itself in 1988, but it had stalled on the runway somewhat from not being in the eye dense, or indeed on screen at all very often. In fact, the television people themselves actively hated the bloody thing. And again, we'll come to the problems with the damn thing in due time, because right now it's still 1990 and Lambie Nen is stuck with it if he wants to create a cohesive BBC identity. And he does. Early versions didn't quite work out. The decision was made early on to stick with the globe motif for BBC One, but using it as the O in the word one didn't impress Jonathan Powell much, and the idea of replacing the personality-free stencil to with the same word in different interesting configurations similarly, let's say, died in subcommittee. Nevertheless, Lampy Nen was given the go-ahead to complete the job over their nemesis Wolf Arlins and Michael Peters himself working with the BBC's own promotions department. They soon dropped the notion of spelling the numbers out, instead designing distinctive versions of the numerals, which is harder than it sounds. 
the one in BBC One had to be flexible and stately, capable of introducing panorama or neighbours without seeming incongruous in either case. A slim, friendly-looking serif fluted up the middle like a Doric column fitted the bill, and it was inserted into a swirling, computer-generated, impressionistic version of the old mirror globe, which successfully communicated the idea of the BBC One globe without ever resolving into a solid object. For BBC Two, Leonard Binet had its own plans. The fluted one would appear in multiple guises over the years, but it would rarely ever be asked to do anything but sit there. The new BBC Two logo was to have Personality Plus from the outset. Lambinan realised early on that everything Alan Yentob wanted BBC Two to be couldn't be encapsulated in a single ident. It would need a whole package. With the new logo, whatever it was, in a multitude of settings, moods and even activities. So it had to be much, much more flexible than the one, in a more physical sense. It needed to be chubby, so that the designers would have as much freedom as possible to distort it before it became unrecognisable. But it had to be interesting and dynamic too, so it felt vaguely natural in motion. And we all know what they ended up with. A fat, hand-drawn variation on the number two in Gill Sands, with the curve at the top sliced off at a right angle, and the one at the bottom coming to a lethal-looking sharp point. The rest is history, and I could go into arse-aching detail about the minutiae of the resulting idents. But I'm overrunning anyway, and it's still only 1991 in the story, so instead I'll link to the famous How Do They Do That segment, which says more or less everything I was going to say anyway, and has interviews with Martin himself. Not to mention Alan Yentob and Tony and Gaynor Sadler, the husband and wife team behind the music. You'll find that at is.gd forward slash how did they do that, all one word. That should be on screen right now, and there is a non-zero chance I'll remember to put it in the description, so you can just click on it. So go and have a look at that, and I'll see you for what should be the last part, but might very well not be, next time. You've been watching a Bob the Fish production. Thanks! If you haven't found it already, be sure to check out our website at bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds of videos, not unlike this one, that will make you laugh, think, and realize new things, or your money back. Which works out great because they're all absolutely free! All of this is possible thanks to the not unique way that Bob the Fish productions are paid for by you, the viewing public, via Patreon. For a donation of as little as £1 a month, not only do you ensure that I still have food and shelter so I can carry on making these programmes, but you could become eligible for a whole host of cool extras. New video essays, special event live streams, all my content a week in advance, and my book on the history of the BBC, Rule the Waves, chapter by chapter as it's written. And some cake, if you go out and buy a cake and eat it while you're watching. And if you don't want to support on a monthly basis, you can make a one-off donation via coffee. It all helps stave off scurvy. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is. <laughs>